Hey everyone, uh, thanks for tuning in to our James, Book of James Bible study. And we're just going to get right into the scripture. We're going to read some scriptures. Obviously, last time we were together, we read through uh, the first few verses in the book of James. And I'm going to pick up on it in verse 16. And then uh, as we kind of prime the pump here, we'll allow uh, ourselves to just kind of formulate some questions and some thoughts or some comments, some things that stick out to you when you begin to read the scripture because every time we read the scripture we ought to read it prayerfully and carefully so so let's pray together to get started and uh welcome john here and everybody that's that's uh, gathered here today and everybody that's online so god we just say thank you thank you for today thank you for your spirit within us and thank you for your spirit that inspired your word. So as we read through the book of James, God, may you inspire our hearts, illuminate our minds, allow us to see what only you can allow us to see. So give us wisdom, give us guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the book of James is the New Testament book of Proverbs, so to speak. It's a book of wisdom. So we're trying to gather out that wisdom, trying to pull that wisdom out by the Spirit of God. And I'm just going to prime the pump and then uh, John can jump in, add whatever he likes. And those of you guys here that want to add and those of you online, just go ahead and uh, put a thought, a comment in. So verse 16 says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Let me just pause there. The last few verses that we've been talking about is verses that say, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So Proverbs is a book of, of giving us wisdom so we're not deceived. James is a book of wisdom so that we would not be deceived. And in verse 17, every good and Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And again, let me remind you, just as, you're, as we're reading through, let, let the Holy Spirit grip your attention on maybe a phrase or a thought. Verse 21, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes, him, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God the fa and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and keep oneself unspotted from the world. So, lots and lots of stuff that we could meditate on, lots of stuff that we can think about. But again, remember the context of discerning wisdom. So, uh, any, any thoughts on, on this so far, John? Or any of you guys in here? So far, no. I don't have much. Yeah, how about uh, how about how about you guys? Any any thoughts? Anything that sticks out to you? How's our chat going? A few on the chat there. 
Well, you know what's interesting about these verses to me is how there should be a distinction between how God's grace works in our life as believers. How, how does God begin to transform us and change us? This is definitely one of the things that James is driving at here. If you remember the verses prior to this, he talks about two, two processes one is a process that leads to death or a pathway that leads to death. And one is a process or a pathway that leads to life. And to be discerning is to have the wisdom that God intends us to have. He says every good and perfect gift comes from God. The, the good things come from God. The, the, the bad things come from a different source, not God. Right? So that's a point of discernment. Right. So as we as we kind of press into our own personal transformation, you know, he's asking us to evaluate our hearts. To say, OK, are we doers of the word? Or just hearers of the word? Yeah. What do you guys what do you guys have to say? Any any thoughts? Keep priming. What do you think of this verse? Of his own will, he begotten us or he has brought us forth by the word of truth that we may be kind of a first fruits of his creatures. Anything, anything significant there? <laughs> I know it is. That's verse 18, sorry. Verse 18, of his own will, he has begotten us or brought us forth by the word of truth, depending on what translation you have, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Like we're talking about a very, very significant New Testament dynamic, which is new birth. Right? This, this, this dynamic is very different than trying to just live up to a legalistic set of rules. So, discerning that, discerning between, here's one good thing to discern from, Old Testament covenant and New Testament covenant life. The New Testament covenant, covenant life is born from above, is empowered by God's Spirit, and it begins to transform us, it begins to change us as we partake of it. So a, an indication of us partaking of this New Testament grace is are we doers of the Word? That's an indication, right, a point of discernment of whether we're really getting the gospel. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think this just harkens back to the first video that we, or the first Bible study that we had uh, when we were talking about the controversy that came about when Martin Luther struggled with these passages. Um, but obviously the, the faith that he's talking about is the faith that will inevitably do work and do things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it just reminds me of the stuff that we've yeah. gone over in prior Bible yeah. studies. Yeah, faith that works. Like our faith should access a grace or an empowerment Another little thing that popped out in verse 20, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Sometimes I can feel that. I can, maybe wrath isn't the right word, but it's like a, a striving, and sometimes it turns into frustration and anger. And, 
in uh in an attempt to get something out of you know the world mm. yeah trying to build something striving for things doing work and sometimes it leaves you frustrated mm -hmm. and even leads to you know these moments of anger why aren't things working out mm -hmm. yeah. scripture here says the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of god right everything needs to be brought into alignment for all elements of your life to start clicking and flowing together Yeah, this this whole idea of a grace that works or, or faith that accesses a grace that produces works. Like, we don't see a vine, a grapevine, just so angry that they have to produce fruit. They just naturally produce fruit. They're not grunting fruit out. They're They're growing. That that vine, when you know Jesus is John fifteen, I am the vine, you are the branches. The vine is giving life to the branches. This grace that's flowing, and notice notice all the ideas of 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 a grace that grows, like this this organic implanted word. So the life is or this New Testament grace, the life is within the seed, right? It says we're born again. We are brought forth by this word of truth. Well, what, what's he referring to? Well, Jesus was the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. He gave us this New Testament place of grace, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. These verses say the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Well, what, I guess what begs the question, what does produce the righteousness of God? Any thoughts? Right. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I'm thinking more a big picture or, or, or uh, the, the essence of how God saves us. I mean, this is a very, <laughs> you know, like we always say, if, if you don't know the answer, just say Jesus or obey, and you'll pro that would probably be the right answer. But, but Jesus is our righteousness. You know, when we get placed in him, he's producing fruits naturally or supernaturally by his connection with the father. I'm the vine, you are the branches. My father is the husbandman. God, Jesus is in this relationship and naturally or supernaturally producing fruit. By the, by the spirit. By the spirit. So this, this movement of grace within us, right? Um, like as as we look at these verses of scripture the wrath of man the, the or you could say the efforts of man your efforts my efforts will not be sufficient like we talked about this last sunday we can take our little bucket of goodness and try to bring it up the holy mountain of god and try to add to god and pour on our goodness and yet god is holy lacking nothing He's wanting us to partake of his goodness. And when we partake of his goodness, we produce fruit such as meekness, as you mentioned, right? The fruit is a byproduct of the root. What are we connected with? Who are we connected with? So when, he, and again, James is, is trying to push us towards this discernment. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. So this is this. What is the engrafted word? That it's, what is this engrafted word which is able to save your soul? And I would go back to Jesus was the word that became flesh, dwelt among us. He's the one that in 
inaugurated this new kingdom. And the kingdom is as a man plants a seed in the ground. Right? And Jesus would say those words over and over again. And he would say, you know, you got to understand this parable. The kingdom comes to human hearts by God's word. Right? How, how do we receive that word? Like, how do we receive the message of Jesus that he, you know, his life, his death, his resurrection? How we receive that is going to determine how well we receive who we are. I mean, there's tons and tons within that one statement, this, this, this implanted word, right, that we have to be born again of his seed, his righteousness, his connection with the Father, his perfection, now is given to us as a grace gift of God. Mm. Is receiving this engrafted word, which is able to save your souls, is that being born again? Yeah. Okay, so then there is a work of the Spirit that happens prior to us being born again inside of us. If there's, and this kind of goes, I think, to maybe your comment about what, uh, um, how do we work that righteousness of God? And you said me meekness, I think, was your answer. But there seems to be a work of the Spirit that's going on inside of us before we're even born again. If we're receiving with meekness, the engrafted word that is able to save our souls. Right, but don't forget the same grace that saves us, that births us into the kingdom, is the same grace that grows us. So that same dynamic is at work. So the Holy Spirit is at work on every human heart. So that soil, your soil, my soil, the Holy Spirit's working on that soil. That soil has to be open. Remember, Jesus said, you know, the, the word can come and it could be hard and just get picked off. Or it could be shallow and just have no root. Or it could be weedy, have a bunch of other things in competition with it. Or it could be fruitful, right? So the Holy Spirit is, first of all, preparing the soil. What did John the Baptist do? Come came and prepared the way of the Lord. He prepared the soil of people's hearts by preaching the kingdom of God. Repent for the kingdom of God is, is near. That is a work of the Holy Spirit, preparing the soil of people's hearts. So then what shows up? Like just a book, a message? No, a person. Jesus shows up. He, he manifests the kingdom of God. It's from him that we begin to conceive, oh, what is reality? What is, what, is, what is real? And we see it in him. And so all of a sudden our hearts receive that and we, it, it births in us and we go, wow. Like, you know, remember, you know, Jesus shows up in the gospel of Mark like we talked about and, and some people received it. And some people said, oh, I don't know what to think about it. And some people just totally rejected it. Right? But then we have to continue to follow. And as we hear and respond, we hear and respond, that allows that dynamic of growth to happen in us from conception to root to tree to fruit. That's what I think... James is driving at here when he says, you got to be doers of the word. So the conception is the moment of born againness? Mm -hmm. I would say. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's part of that, you know, that dynamic. And then, so how do we receive with meekness? Right. So meekness has to do with the, the, the openness of our hearts, how teachable we are, how it's what Jesus would say it this way. 
those who have ears to hear, let them hear. That would be a meek person. If they're hearing and responding to the message of the gospel, you know, the good news. What is the good news? The good news is Jesus has shown up and provided a way to be reconnected to life and reality. Yeah. I'm pausing so that you guys can interject. I'm just very hesitant to go where I feel like this is inevitably going to go at some point in this book. <laughs> we almost, we brushed on it uh, two weeks ago. And it's, it comes down to this question of uh, how can a dead man respond to the call of the Spirit? Mm -hmm. Is this anything that has to do with us choosing? Does it have anything to do with us responding in some way that is our individual selves responding? Mm -hmm. um, yes. It says that we're receiving with meekness, but I'm wondering how one acquires this meekness if this has not been birthed in us before, if we're dead mm -hmm. spiritually. Mm -hmm. Right. And the big, this is another can of worms, right. along you're, with you're, the, you're, uh, you're why, why is, uh, why is what her, uh, why is wisdom referred to as her? Or patience. <laughs> why is patience referred to as her? <laughs> right. But to, to, um, Wriggly worms, what, what, as may would say. What we're trying to what we're trying to be discerning of and gain wisdom of is what is this what is this dynamic that's going on? That's what the first verses we read last week. Um, what what is what what is going on? God is trying to father children. Well, that begins with conception, and then it has to continue with his fathering, disciplining hand. But then we got this messed up situation of a fallen world and evil and temptation and our own evil hearts and foolish hearts. So God comes in all his perfections and all his, you know, amazingness and steps into our world, the incarnation, and he literally demonstrates a son in relationship with his father. So that's the initiation. For dead people, life has just shown up. If he doesn't show up, we remain dead in our trespasses and sin. But he does show up, and because he does show up, we can have faith because of his massive faithfulness, his sufficiency, we can have faith. We can partake of his divine nature, his all sufficiency. God is the only self-sufficient being in the universe. We are dependent beings. We are those that have to continue with meekness to receive. So, is there a choice involved? Yes, because it's a relationship. What God is after is a relationship, not a dictatorship. He, he doesn't need to add anything to his glory. He's glorious in and of himself. What he wants us to do is partake of his overflow of sufficiency or overflow of goodness. So this, this word that became flesh and dwelt among us is an overflow of God's goodness. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Jesus came from the Father. The Holy Spirit comes from the Father. This overflow is the gospel message that's to be implanted within our soul. I pause. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and a simple phrase is, what do we have that we did not first receive? So then with the receiving of his faithfulness, will we have faith and participate? Participate in the, the grace work of, of God. And that's what James is encouraging us to do, to see, is, is our faith working? Are we actually participating or are we just looking at the gospel as a get out of hell free card? Like, what if what if we were saved from our sin, but we remained the same rotten people that we are? Like, that would be a tragedy. But God not only saves us from our sin; He's transforming us. He's He's fathering us, and He does that through a relationship, through an interdependent relationship with him that we have to continue to fulfill the great commandment to love God with all our heart, soul, and strength, love our neighbors as ourselves. You know, that is always a grace work of God. It's a gift from God. Any, uh, any other thoughts or... or uh, just to clear things up, in uh, I guess my experience, it has been the case that you get born again and then you get filled with the Spirit. But it's the Spirit working in us already that brings us to a point of repentance and being born again. And then we get filled with the Spirit. So what is the difference between the Spirit working in us somehow and then getting filled with the Spirit? Well, um, maybe we could put it in terms of baptisms, right? The, the New Testament talks about a, a number of different baptisms. So the first baptism we receive is, the, is being baptized into Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. So what's the Holy Spirit doing uh, in souls and upon souls that are not yet born again? Well, the Holy Spirit is convicting people of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Right? That, that, they're, and he's glorifying Jesus. The Holy Spirit is glorifying who Jesus is. And people are getting revelation that, that, that he's, our, he's a Savior. So then the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ. But not only does the New Testament teach us that we're baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit, but Jesus is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. So not only are we placed in Christ, but Christ is placed within us. So Jesus said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. He said to the woman at the well in, in John chapter 4 uh, that you will, there will be a well established on the inside of you, a well of salvation through Christ, his perfections, now flowing through you. So you're, I mean, the the dogmatics of it is probably what you're focused on. Like, well, I'm just wondering, there, there the seems spirit? to be this event that, or these events that follow your being born again. So mm -hmm. you accept Christ, and then you get filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And there are these two separate events that you have, and then you maybe get water baptized. Yeah, and I think it's... So is being filled with the Spirit something that we maybe shouldn't look at as a single event since the spirit is already working in us prior to right. and it seems as though i mean the apostles were filled with the spirit after jesus ascended and it seemed as though they continued to be filled with the spirit in many instances throughout the story and mm -hmm. the, the acts mm -hmm. 
So is this maybe something that we have slipped up on and kind of categorizing it as this event where you get prayed over and you're filled with the spirit and you speak in, in tongues. tongues. Like yeah. <laughs> you can say it. I was going to say gibberish, but... <laughs> You're right. Now, and, and I think it's unfortunate that we do end up categorizing things that this is that, but it's both and. And I think Josiah might have been yes. wanting to you say, had the mic up. May, say something. I think, I think it's, a, it's a lifetime filling. A lifetime Definitely. filling yeah. over yeah, and over. Like the spirit works in us. see where I was guided yeah. um, but I also think yeah there's like so far that you brought up the apostles were filled I think that was because you see how many people were saved from that right when there's there's the spirit is using um, an event like that to bring others to Christ to glorify Christ mm -hmm. right so it's it's there's moments I think where it's exponential but we are always infilled with the spirit mm -hmm. right right so this this dynamic did you, did you want to add something to that yeah i just uh, if anybody's had the experience of hearing or being asked the question have you been filled with the spirit um as a similar question to have you been saved or have you been born again Maybe these are the. This is the wrong way of looking right. at it. And I and I, I think we should be I, being saved and be being filled. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't help but think that James is writing to Christians here, not unbelievers. Right. right. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what John just referred to Ephesians, you know, be being filled. This is this constant overflow and a constant dynamic that's happening. And I think it is a, I think it is, a, from, in my view, it's a mistake to simply make uh, being filled with the Spirit an event that happened rather than instead of it being something that happens to us, it's someone who's ministering to us. When does the Holy Spirit stop ministering to us? When does Jesus and the Father stop ministering to us? Well, they're, they're constantly active. It has to do with our hearing and our responding. Our hearing and responding, exactly. So, so in some ways, I see it, the, these overflow events are moments of fruitfulness. Like I, I, I see spirit fullness as like if you're working on music and you're, uh, you know, pressing in with your giftings and your, but you're all, you're allowing and partnering with the Holy Spirit to overflow you with new creativity, writing a new song. That, that's an overflow. That's an overflow from a relationship. Who is Jesus? He's the overflow of the Father. He's the only and eternally begotten of the Father. Now, we're talking about the Trinity here, but, but it's important that we understand that Jesus, in his redemptive activity, is an overflow of the Father by the Spirit. What is Jesus coming to do in our lives? He's coming to, to work that same dynamic in us. And what's interesting is I, I in my doctorate work, I had a lot of pushback on this whole idea of born again and it just simply being an event or this ongoing process and for me, it's a both and venture, not just I was born again and that was something that happened a long time ago, but it's the same dynamic that saves us is the same dynamic that grows us. So when we say 
that uh, Jesus breathed upon the, the disciples and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that's when they were truly birthed into the new kingdom of God. Well, are they filled with the Spirit? Absolutely. Now they have to continue to wait on the Lord for his movements, his, his initiatives, because something super dynamic is about to happen. He's about to birth the whole church in Acts chapter 2. Right? So they're waiting on the Lord. They're learning to participate in this relationship that they have with the Holy Spirit through their relationship with Christ. So they're making this transition, right, from, from Jesus modeling the church and them being the church, right? Jesus is the quintessential spirit-filled person. Like he's just constantly overflowing with miracles and provisions and wisdom and worship. And now we're to learn to live in that relationship with God so that the same fruits that attended Jesus' ministry begin to attend our ministry or our life. You know, I mean, again, that's another thing, you know, ministry, like ministry gets, you know, that's something pastors do. No, I, I'm just talking about life, doing life, doing life with God, doing life with one another. So I, I do agree with you, John. There's, a, there's too many uh, um, labels put on what it means to be spirit-filled, for example, or filled with the Spirit. Are you filled with the Spirit? Well, if you're born again... You have the well of salvation established in you. That well can, can flow at, as we continue to, with meekness, receive the overflow. You know, and you've seen me do that example of pleroma. What is pleroma it, that, or fullness? What is spirit fullness? Spirit fullness is not when we're just, you know, the, the glass is full and bulging. Spirit fullness is when it's overflowing. Anytime you're overflowing, you're spirit filled. <laughs> like, but that overflow is this constant supply f- from God. It's, and, and, and we get so event and miracle minded uh, rather than, than just like we're living in relationship. We are these. These, these saturated, we should be, these saturated sponges that anytime somebody just like bumps into us a little bit, we just kind of, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the, the, a sponge that's just like absolutely saturated. Like if you touch it, it's going to, you know, flow out. That's the way we should be. That's a spirit-filled Christian in my, in my definition. Only when people touch you. (laughs) Uh, See, we're we're trying to describe in metaphors and examples an amazing dynamic, a relationship, right? Right? Yeah, and then we we're talking now a lot uh, with respects to hearing and responding. And yet James is uh, kind of harping on the doing. Mm-hmm. And so now we go back to the Martin Luther, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, hearing and responding, which was, you know, you're saved right. by faith, right. by grace through faith. Right. So well, it's this response you have to yeah. the... Yeah. That call of the spirit. Yeah. Uh, but uh, now we're kind of, I don't know if it's off base now, but it, it it's not off base. It's still, they're supposed to flow together. But I'm now thinking that maybe it's not as inevitable that when we hear the word that we actually go and do it. Because in the next verses, when he talks about, 
It's as if a man beholds himself in a mirror, sees his reflection, knows who he is, you know, hears the word, accepts it, knows what he's supposed to do, but then leaves and forgets the type of man that he is and does something else. So maybe this is also another both and thing. These uh, responses need to be followed up by, you know, uh, a choice on our part to engage in it yeah. again. Absolutely. In works. Absolutely. Or we end up deceiving ourselves. We just get information about serving, for example. Serving is a spirit-filled venture. We should be serving because of the movement and overflow of the spirit. So when James is trying to teach us about wisdom on how we participate with a relationship with God, he's teaching us that there's some things that we're going to have to step out and do so that we can get the feel of it. Now, think about it in a natural sense. If your father came to you and said, you know, I want you to change the tire on the vehicle outside, you know, because it's flat. And all's, all's we did is talk about it in the, in the living room about, okay, there's a, there's a wrench and there's nuts on the, on the, and here's the tire and there's a jack, you have to do all this. And it's like, you know, the, the boy's like, you know, I mean, I think I get it. I think I got the information. But it's not until he steps out and does it that he actually gets the feel of what it's like to change a flat tire. That dynamic is the same in any type of, of learning venture, any type of knowing venture. When, when, we, when we talk about being spirit-filled and knowing God, to know God and to know ourselves, there has to be a stepping out. There has to be a participation in. And we talked about last week how, how God, you know, he's, he's, not just, he's not grading us like uh, he's trying to grow us. He's not trying to figure out, he's not testing us to fail us. He's, he's giving us opportunities to be doers of the word so that when you begin to do the word, he goes, oh, that, did you feel that? If you, if you want to use that analogy, like if, if you actually feel what it's like to change a tire, you'll get better and better and better at it. And then there's this information and, and, a, and an integration of that feel. Now, and you guys know I'm a, I'm a coach from years back. So I would teach people jump shots that way all the time. I, I would give them the information, give them the information, and then I'd say, okay, try it, try it. And then when they, you get them in the right position and they shoot that shot and they swish it, you go, okay, remember what that felt like. Now take that into what we're talking about here. We have to be doers of the word. When, when God says, you need to have compassion for uh, the, the vulnerable. Pure undefiled religion is, is to say, okay, who's vulnerable? Well, orphans, widows. Okay, well, what does it mean, what does it feel like to actually engage in that kind of ministry? You're, you're going to have to engage in it. Well, I don't really want to. I don't really feel like it. I don't have time to. Well, you're never going to feel the Spirit flowing through you to help an orphan or a widow unless you actually step out and do it. God's not going to make you do it. Now, he'll give inc inclinations, right? He'll, he'll, he'll start to move in you, and you'll start to learn that. You'll start to learn, okay, I'm being moved with compassion here. But remember, it's, a, it's an ongoing relationship, partnership, that we could shut off at any time. Like, no, nah, I'm too busy or, you know, whatever. I mean, that's just one example of many, many, many examples that we could give of God fathering us, and we have to be doers of the word, Otherwise, we just hear a good message, we agree with it, we walk out and forget that we are God's children. We're, we're, we're sons and daughters of God, and God wants to flow through us provision, not only for us, but through us.
Dookie Drew says the purpose of the overflow is relationship, which, when you think about it, is, I mean, like, it's an obvious thing, but still a, a profound statement to make. Overflowing where? Onto what? The purpose of the overflow is is to reach others, mm-hmm. connect with others, and connect yeah. uh, from that yeah. the, them to Christ, or yeah, they and have if, yeah. And if we could been say connected to the source and reciprocate that same sort of relational dynamic where they're being filled and overflowing, mm-hmm. um, and then she ends it with relationship always seems to be tested. Yeah. And especially with the brokenness within us, the brokenness around us. But as Deidre says that, there's a flow. There's a, when we talk about an overflow, there's a flow. There's a flow that comes from God that causes us to be born again. That seed is planted within us. Now there has to be an overflow. So the flow is coming to us, growing the seed within us, and flowing blessings upon other people. That's all one dynamic going on. My re- just, just think of Jesus. He's in relationship with the Father, and he's, he's not trying to manufacture fruit. He's not trying to manufacture casting out devils. He's just being his beautiful self in relationship with his Father, being in obedience, and he's flowing He's being moved with compassion. He's doing it perfectly. <laughs> We're doing it um, imperfectly. But with the help of the Holy Spirit and by the fathering hand of God, through the, through the, through the saviorship of our Savior Jesus, right? This is that righteousness that God has given us that won't be produced by the wrath of man, but will be produced by the Spirit in Christ. Amen. We should wrap up. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, um, those of us here will get together and pray together. But those of you guys that are online, just take a moment and pray some of these thoughts. Maybe you can have a little bit more discussion. Maybe some things stuck out to you. It's hard to have discussion with us and somebody there at the same time. So maybe you could just have a, have a discussion. But, but take the time and pray. Pray over what we've talked about here. So uh, let's just um, end it there. But I'm going to just pray uh, a general prayer. And then we're going to pray here as a group. And you guys can pray at home. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for you are the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And you are the word that saves our soul. Your message, your life, your relationship, your connection with the Father is what saves our soul. Help us partake of your divine nature through your awesome, amazing, infinite, beautiful grace of your salvation through the, through the cross, through your life, your death, and your resurrection. Help us to see it more clearly. Help us to feed on your faithfulness and be able to overflow, to overflow, to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Lord, that we would not be deceived, but that we would be growing Christians, growing sons and daughters of yours. This is why you gave your life to birth us as your sons and daughters. So we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So bless you all, and we'll see you again next Bible study.